Vic presents the Matinee Theater, starring Victor Jory in Random Harvest. Vic, the makers of Vic's Vapor Rub, Vic's Vatronol, Vic's Cough Drops, and Vic's Inhaler brings you the Matinee Theater. Starring Victor Jory and featuring Gertrude Warner in Random Harvest. Now, here's a good thing to remember when you catch a cold. The best-known home remedy for relieving miseries of colds is Vicks VapoRub. James Hilton is one of the truly great authors of our time. From his pen has come such unforgettable stories as Goodbye, Mr. Chip, Lost Horizon, and the story from which our radio play is taken today, Random Harvest. Our play opens in England, in the study of that leader of English politics and finance, Charles Rainier who sits writing a letter to his wife. My dear wife, I'm writing you this letter to tell you some of the things that I otherwise find very difficult to put into words. It's not easy to say to your wife, there's been another woman, but I must say it. Yes, there's been two important women in my life. One is, of course, you, and the other is Paula. Let me tell you the things that I can remember about Paula, and let me tell you all the things that have suddenly become clear. To do that, I must go back to 1917. I was a different man then, a man without a name and without a past. I was weak and confused, a victim of shell shock, living at the hospital for such cases in Melbury. One morning in November, I was taking the regulation walk about the hospital grounds. As I neared the gate, the siren suddenly started screaming, and then a second and a third. And the two guards at the gate left it and ran back towards the hospital. The gates were never locked. I pushed one of them open and went out. It was as simple as that. The streets were mobbed with people, and I got suddenly panicky. So I opened the first door I came to and stepped inside. I looked around and saw that I was in a small tobacco shop. There was a woman behind the counter, and she stared at me, gasped, and ran out of the room, and then someone spoke. Hello there. I turned around, and there was Paula. You've got to get out of here, you know. She's gone to fetch one of the guards. She realized where you're from. That's why she ran like that. You all from the asylum, aren't you? Yes. How did you get out? The guards heard the siren and left the gates for a moment. I just walked out. Do you know why the sirens were going? No. The war's over. Isn't that wonderful? I don't know. I suppose it is. Look, old boy. Better get a move on. That woman will be coming back with a guard. Where do you want to go? I suppose I ought to... Go back to the hospital. Do you like it there? No, I don't. Well, then you shouldn't go back. How can you get well in the place when you're not happy there? Suppose I take you over to Griffith's Hotel. You can rest there and think things over. Griffith's a good friend of mine. He'll be glad to help you out. Here, let me take your arm. We'll take it slowly. Somehow she got me to Biffers and up to a small clean room where I went to bed. When I awoke, it was morning and she was standing there, looking down at me. Good morning. I brought you some tea. Thank you. You're very good to me. My name's Paula Ridgeway. I'm a dancer with a theatrical troupe. What's your name? The doctors call me Smith. I, I don't remember what it should be. I see. Well, I'm not much on formality, so I'll call you Smithy. Smithy, I've something to tell you. I've been talking to Biffer. Remember, I told you he was the proprietor of this hotel? Uh, yes. Well, he's just lost his gardener, and he says he'll take you on. I think it might be good for you to have a quiet job in the fresh air. Why are you so good to me? I like you, Smithy. And somehow I feel, because I found you, that you belong to me. And so I began work in the hotel garden. Paul had to leave with a show, but they were playing near Melbury, and she managed to come to visit every Sunday. They were wonderful Sundays. Smithy, darling, I talked Pissa into letting me fix a picnic lunch. 
We'll take the bicycles and go way back into the country. Sunday after Sunday, we explored the countryside on wheel and foot. At first, I was hesitant about venturing from the hotel because I knew the hospital was searching for me, but gradually I got over that as no one ever questioned me, and something that had been a cold, dead weight inside me vanished, and something warm and exciting took its place. I didn't realize what it was until one Sunday night when Paula was leaving. She looked up at me to say goodbye, and suddenly I... I wanted to kiss her. Smithy, I do hate to leave you. I hate to have you go. You bring a lot of happiness with you, Paula. I take a lot of happiness away. You're so beautiful. Oh, Paula. There are so many things I would like to say to you. Say them, Smithy. Say them. No, Paula. Not now. All right, Smithy. Have it your own way. Goodbye. See you next Sunday. I knew I had hurt her. And I was sorry. But it was too beautiful to risk spoiling. And then, one Sunday evening, she came bursting into the greenhouse where I was working on some plants and she was breathless and excited and frightened. Oh, Smithy, you've got to leave here right away. There are two men from Melbourne Hospital talking to Biffa in the bar. They found out you're here. They say they must take you back to the hospital, Smithy. Take me back to the hospital. Take me back to the hospital? We'll run away. I'll pack your bag and meet you at our beech tree in a few minutes. Paula ran to the house to get my things, and I stood there a moment, my heart pounding, my hands turned to ice. And then suddenly I was running, not towards the beach tree, but towards the railroad station. I was in a panic. I was in a terror to escape. There was a train waiting in the station. I got aboard, and the minute it started, looking out the window, I saw Paula running, but I knew she was too late. The train moved off through the darkness faster and faster, and I said softly, Goodbye. Goodbye, Paula. And I felt a little like crying, even though I was free and at peace. Early in the morning, the train stopped at a small village called Beachings Over, and I got off there. I couldn't tell you why, except that the air was sweet with the scent of hay and flowers, and I, I crossed a stone bridge and turned off the road by a path that climbed a hill. Near at hand was a cottage with a buxom elderly woman tending a garden. Good morning, sir. There'll be a nice view from the top of the hill this morning. You can see five counties on a clear day. Oh, then I'll go right up. I'd like to see five counties this morning. I climbed to the top. I looked for almost an hour at those five counties glimmering through the morning mist. And then I stretched out under a tree and closed my eyes. Never wake up. I've been sitting here watching you for hours. Paula! Why did you run away from me, Smithy? I wasn't running away from you. I was running away from everything. How... How did you ever find me up here? I saw you get on the train. And I kept asking the porters at each station whether you got off. The porter at Beechings Over remembered you very well. And the woman at the foot of the hill told me you were up here looking at the five counties. Oh, don't you know I'll always find you, Smithy? As long as you need me. Paula, you've been so good and so generous. But I can do without you now, and I must. Oh, Smithy, darling, what on earth do you have against me? Do you really want to know that, Paula? I've just got to know, Smithy. All right, then. The only thing I have against you is that I'm in love with you. You, you love me? You love me. <laughs> oh, Smithy, do you? Please don't joke about it. Because, you see, I've loved you ever since I first set eyes on you. <laughs> oh, Smithy, Smithy, are you sure? No, oh, yes. I'm very sure. The one thing in my mind and in my heart that I know is real now and for all time is you, Paul. Oh, my darling, hold me close. Don't ever let me go. I love you so much. But I... I have nothing to offer you. I'm only asking for your love and your devotion. It's not enough. It's more than enough. Oh, no. No, Paula, no. I... I can't wish marriage like on you. It isn't fair. It isn't right. When you say, I take this man, it, it has to mean something more than... 
I take Smith, amnesia patient. I take Smith, a man without a home or a background, without family ties, without memories, Let without... Me stop it! Paula, don't you see? No, I don't see. Oh, Smithy. The past doesn't matter to us. This is a whole new lifetime for each of us now. This is the beginning of a love story. Smithy and Paula for now and forever. As long as we both shall live. No, oh, my darling. You're so sweet. So sweet. Are you going to ask me to marry you? Or uh, must I ask you? <laughs> Miss Ridgway, will you marry me? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Smith. I don't mind if I do. We were married in London by a Parson Blanty that Paul had known since she was a little girl. I remember standing there in that small church, looking at Paula and thinking, you've brought me back from the dead. You've given me life and love and happiness. And I remember praying, dear God, please, don't ever let me bring grief or sadness into her life. Please let me make her happy. And so, by the authority vested in me, I now pronounce you man and wife. We set up housekeeping in the parsonage. Reverend Blampy had far more rooms than he needed, and he said our company would be payment enough. Paula chose the rooms. Two large attic ones with a view over the rooftops as far north as Hampstead. Ah, oh, what fun we had. I can see her now, scrubbing and dusting and cleaning, a smudge on her nose and a glint in her eye, and... Lord, she was beautiful. Hand me that brush, Smithy. I don't want to get down off this ladder. All right, Paula Smith. Paula Smith. Oh, Smithy, I'm so sorry for all the women in the world who aren't married to you. No. Oh. You know, one of these days you're going to be famous. I found that story you were writing last night, and I read it. I hope you don't mind. Oh, uh... What did you think of it? Oh, it's wonderful. Maybe that's what you were before. A writer. Oh, Paul, I... I wonder if I'll ever find out what I was before. You know, Smithy, I'm not sure I want you to anymore. No, why? I might lose you. You might have some life in your past that wouldn't include me. I couldn't live a life that didn't include you and be happy. Oh, Smithy, I hope that's true. Here, help me down from the ladder. I want to kiss you. Hello, Mr. Smith. Hello, Mrs. Smith. The days were days of incomparable beauty. Days that began with Paula's laughter and ended with Paula's kiss. And one day, those days came to their fullest beauty. Smithy! Oh, Smithy, darling, wait until you're here. We're going to have a baby. Smithy, darling, we're going to have a baby. Oh, Paula, 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 my dear. Oh, Smithy. God has given us everything in the world now. God has given me everything in the world. In just a moment, Act Two of Random Harvest, starring Victor Jory. In this day and age, you've got to take your hat off to most mothers. Nowadays, when children come down with colds, these mothers don't waste a minute wondering what to do about it. The modern way they use to relieve miseries of colds is to rub good old Vicks Vapor Rub on throat, chest, and back. Because they have found from personal experience that the moment you rub on Vapor Rub, its relief-giving action starts right to work in the very places where distress is. It helps relieve congestion and irritation in the upper breathing passages, the coughing spasm, sore throat, and that muscular soreness or tightness. Vapor rub is so effective because it penetrates, penetrates into the cold, congested upper bronchial tubes with its special soothing medicinal vapors, and at the same time, it stimulates stimulates chest and back surfaces like a comforting, warming portus. And Vapor Rub 
keeps right on working for hours to bring comforting relief. And always remember, only VapoRub gives you this special penetrating, stimulating action. The best-known home remedy for relieving miseries of cold is Vicks VapoRub. Now the second act of Random Harvest, starring Victor Jory and featuring Gertrude Warner. We return to the study where Charles Rainier continues with the letter to his wife. Yes, my dear, there have been two women in my life. One was you and the other was Paula. Perhaps you'll think it's strange my writing you about Paula. But I want you to know all that I remember and cherish about that other lifetime that I lived with her. I was going to have a son, and I wanted desperately to give that son a name and a heritage. I spent part of every day writing. I used to take everything I wrote to Reverend Blampy. He liked some of my stories and sent them to a friend of his who was a publisher in Liverpool. And one day... Smithy, Smithy, I just had a letter from Mr. Lamb in Liverpool. Yes? He, he thinks your stories show remarkable progress. He's going to buy them. Oh, say, that's, that's wonderful. He wants you to come to Liverpool to talk to him tomorrow. Oh, well, I'll... I'll talk to Paula about it tonight. I... I don't like to leave her just now. Oh, Paula, I want you to go. Yes, I know she will. I'll talk to her. Paula, what's wrong? What's wrong? Why are you looking like that? Don't you want me to go to Liverpool? Yes, of course. It's just that... Oh, Smithy, you've never gone away from me before. And I'm frightened. I don't even know why I'm frightened exactly, except that I had a dream. What? What kind of a dream? I dreamt I held up my arms to you, and you didn't know me. I kept saying over and over, Smithy, it's Paula. But you wouldn't look at me. And I woke up crying. Oh, darling. Darling, surely you aren't going to let a dream upset you. Oh, Smithy... I couldn't bear to lose you. You aren't going to lose me. Don't you remember Smithy and Paula for now and forever as long as we both shall live? That's the way it is, and that's the way it's always going to be. I'm sorry, darling. Of course it's right for you to go to Liverpool. You must go. <laughs> Don't pay any attention to my moods. Part of having a baby, I guess. Like wanting strawberries out of season. Do you know something, Paula Smith? I love you very much. And I'll be back from Liverpool before you know it. I remember very clearly what happened that day. I, I was in a great hurry to get to the publisher's office because I wanted to get back to Paula as soon as possible. And I remember that I stepped from the... Liverpool Station out into the street. It was slippery. I stepped off the curb before I saw the car speeding toward me. I, I tried to run, but I slipped and fell. I heard the screech of brakes and shouts, and then I... I saw nothing and I felt nothing. I came to my senses lying on a park bench in the Liverpool fog. And I knew as I struggled to my feet that... My name was Charles Rainier, and that my family estate was in Sturton. But I remember, remember, remembered nothing of being Smith or of Paula, nothing of any marriage or an approaching child. All I did know was that I had a headache, that I'd been fighting in France, that I'd been a long time getting home. I picked up my life. I picked it up. Picked up the life I'd lived before the war. Business, friends, family. But I was never happy, never at peace. For I knew from the medical records that there were two years in my life after I was wounded that were unaccounted for, and those two years continually tantalized and tormented me, and... And then at the time when I needed you most, you came into my life. You had a smile that went straight to my heart. And you had eyes that seemed to understand everything that was troubling me. You became my secretary and then my wife, and we were married in the cathedral. 
I stood there watching you, wanting to cry from sheer heartache as I listened to the sacred old words. And so, by the authority vested in me, I now pronounce you man and wife. I found myself praying, Dear God, please let me make her happy. And the words burned inside me, and somehow with a sudden shock, I knew I'd said those words before, standing beside another girl in some other time. I knew I had to find that girl. So you and I, my dear, began our lives together like two courteous strangers. I divided my time between the office trying to tie together elusive threads of memory to find the reason why certain places tugged at me, a, a big barn of a parsonage that I passed once in London. I went back to it, only to find that its last tenant, a parson Blampy, had died some time back. Train schedules that I... I spent hours studying and always going back to the name of Beechings Over, Beechings Over, and never knowing why. Newspapers that I read column by column, hunting for something familiar. And finally, one night, reading the name Melbury and knowing that I had to go there. I found it hard to tell you when you asked me where I was going so late at night. I just said, I'm going to Melbury and perhaps to a town named Beechings Over. You got a little white, but you didn't try to stop me and... Once more, I thought, what a really nice person you were and how sad it was that there were shadows between us. I arrived at Melbury around midnight. A policeman came over to the car. Looking for somebody, sir? Why, yes. Yes, I am. I'm... Uh, isn't there a, a hospital here? Yes, sir. We have a new one and an old one, sir. I think I'm after the old one. It's... It's on a hill, isn't it? It has... Big gates and a, a high wall around it. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm sure it has. Ah, that don't sound like either of the hospitals. No. Uh, let's see. Oh, you wouldn't be meaning the asylum, would you, asylum? sir? Asylum? Oh, yes. Yes, I think I do mean the asylum. I'll tell you the way to get No, no, don't, don't bother. Thank you, just the same. I, I know the way. I drove straight to the gates and I stopped the car and got out and... Once more, I could hear the sirens. Once more, I heard shouts of people cheering the armistice. And I, I walked down the hill the same way I'd walked in that other lifetime, down the street and around the corner of the back of the shop, and gradually the mist began to clear, and gradually pictures began to form, and it all came back. You've got to get out of here, you know. She's gone to fetch one of the guards. You are from the asylum, aren't you? How can you get well in a place when you're not happy there? Suppose I take you over to Biffa's Hotel. My name's Paul Ridgway. I'm a dancer with a theatrical troupe. What's your name? There are two men from Melbury Hospital talking to Biffa in the bar. They say they must take you back to the hospital, Smithy. Good morning, sir. There'll be a nice view from the top of the hill this morning. You can see five counters on a clear day. This is the beginning of a love story. Smithy and Paula, from now and forever. Smithy, Smithy, darling, we're going to have a baby. Oh, we're going to have a baby. I'm frightened. I had a dream you didn't know me. I kept saying over and over, Smithy and Paula. But you must go to Liverpool. I'll be waiting, my darling. I'll be waiting, my darling. I stood there, all these things running through my mind, and then I ran to my car and I started down the hill. Somewhere, somehow, I must find Paula Smith. I yelled to policemen. What's the quickest way to Beechings over? Straight down the road until you come to the first road going west. You turn off there. I was on my way before he'd finished giving directions. I didn't stop to think what the chances would be of finding Paula at Beechings over. I only knew it was the next stop on my journey. I arrived early in the morning, and there, God bless a woman, a little plump of a little grayer. Good morning, sir. Are you going up to look at the five counties again? You? You remember me? I, I remember most people. Do you remember? Do you remember there was a girl, she... She came to get me that day. Uh... Paula Smith. Aye, she comes here every once in a while, she does. Spends a lot of time looking down at the five counties. 
But then lots of folks do. Why did she leave? Where can I find her? I couldn't say, sir. But if she comes again, I'll tell her you was asking for her. And once more I climbed to the top, and once more I stood there watching the fogs melt away below me, drinking in the sweet, cool morning mist, watching the sun rise, and then something made me turn, and I saw you running up the hill, and you were Paula Smith. And then I knew who it was who had taken my hand and helped me back to Melbury, and the beach was over. Then I knew that there had only been one woman in my life. And though I thought I'd lost her, she'd always been beside me. And I ran to meet you. And we stood there above the five counties crying and laughing like people who had just come into the kingdom. Smithy. Oh, Smithy, darling. Hello, Paula Smith. Oh, Smithy. I've waited so long to hear you say that. I've waited so long. I know, but it's all right now, darling. The riddle solved. The random years are at an end. Oh, my dear, I have so much to make up to you. It's all made up now. Paula, how... How did you ever manage to trace me after that accident in Liverpool? I saw your picture in a London paper. It said, Charles Rainier returns. I knew right away what had happened. I came to London and applied for the job as your secretary right after the baby died. I never told you who I was because... I didn't want you to have another riddle to worry about. Somehow I was sure the day would come when you would know me and want me again. There's nothing for me to say except thank you. God bless you. There's one more thing, Mr. Smith. I love you, Mrs. Smith. I will love you forever. Thank you, Mr. Smith. That's what I wanted to hear. Come on, darling. Let's go home. Right you are, Smithy. Right you are. In just a moment, a word from Victor Jory. You know, a lot of things you buy and use are not what they were before the war. But that is not true of Vicks VapoRub. There are no wartime substitutes in the VapoRub you buy. It is the same expert formula, the same high quality, the very same VapoRub that has won the confidence of mothers and has become a family standby in so many millions of homes. Yes, my friends, there are no wartime substitutes in the VapoRub you buy. It is the same fine, effective formula that is the best known home remedy for relieving miseries of colds. And the cost to you is the same, too. Time-tested, home-proved, Vicks VapoRub. This is Victor Jory, and next week in response to your request, Vicks brings you Vicks Matinee Theater production of the exciting story, Reap the Wild Wind. The following week... The request play that leads all others according to the mail count, David Selznick's masterful picture, Rebecca. Be sure and write to me in care of Columbia Broadcasting 22, New York, and tell me what plays you'd like to hear. Random Harvest was adapted by Gene Holloway from the novel by James Hilton and was directed by Richard Sandville. The role of Paula was played by Gertrude Warner. Music for this series is under the direction of Mark Warno. Be sure to be with us next week when Vicks, the makers of Vicks VapoRub, Vicks Vatronol, Vicks Cough Drops, and Vicks Inhaler, brings you the matinee theater production of Reap the Wild Wind, starring Victor Jory. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.